So I'd like to add my uh, uh, acknowledgement to the traditional owners of this land, past, present and future, and thank the VAA for actually inviting me to um, actually come here today. So it's wonderful to see you all and see some people that I actually know, which is great. So today I'm going to talk about protecting Australian honey from adulteration. And um, as you know, with all the imported honey coming in, to give the difference between Australian honey and other honeys is actually particularly important if we're ever going to recover the price that we should be afforded for the wonderful product that we actually have. So just to give you an idea where I come from, as you see, I'm not a beekeeper. Um, I actually came in from the botanical side. So um, all my research has actually been on, actually it's a funny thing, it's actually always been on flowering. So the biggest sort of part of my career was actually about um, seed production. So all the forests that you ever go and see, plantation forestry, you see in Western Australia during my time, um, we produced all that seed for all of that. So, I mean, our peak production was about 40 million seedlings going out of the nursery. So that was what my driver was, was how to produce that seed. And, of course, it came very much down to, you know, the flowering and the same thing as you. We were watching for flowering as much as you. Um, I guess the only difference that we had is we were going through, you know, whether the um, capsules actually held, which I think you guys would rather that they drop because then you get more flowering, and then going through to the seed. So um, I then went on, just to give you background, I actually then went to essential oils and actually started going through um, biosynthetic pathways of oil production and very involved in sandalwood. So I spent a lot of time up north in Kununurra. And uh, then I moved to UWA with the University of Western Australia where I met all sorts of researchers and it was wonderful because I was putting projects together and that's actually how I got to get into the bee industry. And so I've come very much from the botanical side, which has actually been really good for this project. And, uh, and I actually think, I was actually shocked seeing the forestry or the forest from beekeepers' eyes. It's, I think you guys actually know more about the forest than anybody else. And it's been a real eye-opener to me. Um, well, just, and also just the, the frustration of the voice that you actually don't have when you actually know the most about them. You know, that's actually what's been quite amazing um, as I've come into the industry. But today we're going to talk about adulteration, and it's actually very much all about um, the forest as it goes on. So let me just get to the next one. So the big thing that um, I wanted to um, talk about was, first off, you know, we, there was a lot of things almost we take, you know, it's coming in from an outsider we took for granted. I think the first surprise that I had when we went through the mellifluous flora was actually how few of the flowers the bees actually really liked. I think just as a stranger, you come and you assume that bees go to everything. And then as you start getting looking closer and closer, you see that actually the palette's quite small. It's not as big as you think it is. And if you start dividing it between pollen and nectar, it is quite different. The, you know, there's, there's, quite, there's completely different things that the bees go for in terms of the pollen, you know, in terms of the nutrition, the amino acids. Whereas when they're going for nectar, you know, it's about the viscosity of the nectar, whether they can actually you know, suck it up in the first place. Um, you know, and even the timing of the nectar production. I mean, you know, nectar peak is, you know, as you all, you know, I'm a, you know, most of the stuff I'm just repeating what you know, but as you know, early in the morning, dries out by lunchtime and then you get, a, you get a small peak in the evening. So, you know, the bees are really only going for nectar in the morning and late in the evening. So the rest of the time it's actually, you know, a pollen foraging. Um, I guess the other thing that also was this um, sort of, you know, how they found the plants. And the thing that's amused me the most is this, the stories about how far the bees fly. And I think flying is a different thing to foraging. You know, so... You know, because, you, know, you, you know, there's been lots of fantastic research sort of saying, you know, I mean, in Western Australia, they keep saying it's six kilometres. From the botanical side of view, if we actually look at it and we look at outcrossing, so that means between two different plants, and you look at the genetics of outcrossing of plants, if you're in a forest, it's only about 1.7 kilometres is the max that you get out. And that includes birds, by the way. So 1.7 kilometres. If you're in open bushland... It's, sorry, sorry, in a forest, sorry, it's 700 metres, in open bushland, it's 1.7 kilometres. So it's actually very small. 
the actual foraging area is not six kilometers. Six kilometers might be scouting, might be something else, but if you're really active and you're actually doing pollination and crossing, it's a much a smaller distance. So I think you know that was actually you know really interesting. Then of course I went on a total tangent, and I started looking at you know what do the bees actually see, you know because we were sort of looking at you know tractants and it was sort of our thing when we were going, you know looking at manuka. So as you know. Um, there was a large seed collection brought in from New Zealand, which one company was developing. And all beautiful colours, different flowering times, whatever. And I said, well, you know, the bees aren't really looking, you know, at the beautiful colours. You know, they're looking, you know, they're, of course, as you know, they're in the UV spectrum. So we wanted to see, you know, what the bees were seeing. And just, and I'm sure the researchers here, if you've ever done it, it's an absolute rabbit hole because reflected light is completely different. You know, it's just a whole different thing, trying to find out what light and what they actually see. It's actually very difficult research to do. But the other thing that shocked me was one of my students went in to look at the acuity. And, you know, they look in pixels. And I was just shocked, because there's this um, model that, you know, I should have actually brought it maybe with me, the model you can do to see what bees see. They're completely blind. You know, I was just, like, shocked. You know, I always thought that, you know, they could... You know, you always assume what you see is what they see. And uh, so when, you, when they talked about, you know, clustering of flowers together, then you can actually understand why that is true, because they just see this blur, and then it sort of comes in to focus. And I'd say focus is actually about sort of so far away from the flower that they're sort of really beginning some sort of focus of seeing what they're looking at. So there's certainly something else that the bees are going for besides vision. You know, and then you start looking at, okay, well... What is in that nectar that actually attracts them? And I guess that leads into sort of what we are going through. So this thing, remember that the flower is designed to do the pollination. The bee is just there attract, attracting. You know, it's, it's just whether it's attracted or not to go to that flower. Whether that flower is pollinated or not is all to do with the flower structure. It's got nothing to do with what you know, the bee does. The bee's just doing its job. So... This is what we are blessed with here in Australia. I think the biggest shock to me was when I went to uh, China. We were sort of talking about, um, you know, honey production here. And they hadn't got the concept about flowering trees. And, you know, because they basically get, you know, some, you know, small patch, but flowering forest as big as we get, it wasn't sort of like a concept that was in their minds. And I suddenly realised that, you know, our biggest marketing opportunity that we have is that we have these massive eucalypt forests or Bankshire forests or Melaleuca forests. There that not many other places, if you go to Europe, most of that is gymnosperms. You know, so it's um, wind-pollinated things. It's not, it's not angiosperms. So what we sit on is this, we should be, with all things put together, is the best honey-producing country in the world. There's no argument about it. We've got the best flora, if we can protect it. That was my heated argument last night, was discussing how on earth we can actually you know, conserve our forests. But if we can conserve our forests, we should be the honey-producing nation of the world. It's just our flora is completely adapted to nectar production. Remember that most of the birds, and our bird life is fantastic, as well as the marsupials, are adapted to the nectar that is produced from our plants. So, you know, so we're completely, you know, so we're sitting on this minefield, pristine forest, no agriculture chemicals in our forest. Every other beekeeper in Europe is battling with, with, ag you know, with agrochemicals that are on the crops that they're dealing with, which we're beginning to understand more so now as we're getting into the pollination. I'm sure it's, it's the biggest discussion now is how we deal with chemicals as we go into the agriculture environment. So, you know, so here we are sitting on this wonderful, wonderful uh, resource. And, you know, and then the, the simple thing about honey, we forget, you know, the, uh, so uh, Nick and I have been talking about being on the honey committee, and you'll hear from Nick just now, but, um, you know, and it's all about this, you know, chemistry and whatever and, you know, breaking it up and how expensive can the, the analysis be and, you know, how can it be down to the, you know, the billionth part and whatever. And you sort of think, my golly gosh, you know, this is a natural product. Its diversity is actually what's its strength, you know, because Kate Hammer, who does a lot of um, antibacterial work for us in Western Australia, we have this big argument, you know, 
We need the single component, you know, almost like what Manuka has done, you know, for the peroxide, you know, um, antibacterial action. And she says, you know, the strength of honey is just the whole complexity of it. You know, whether it's the acidity, whether it is the phenolics, whether it is, you know, all the different components that make it up, the strength is actually, it's, 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 it's multiple aspects. So you can never, ever get resistance against any of that antibacterial activity. That is its strength. So anyway, so just, so we go back, you know, here's the SPI. And I think the other thing that, you know, sort of only really got to understand as we started doing, unfortunately, all the chemistry, is for a bee to be like a squirrel to store honey, it's got to be a huge nectar source. You know, so even though we've got a small pallet of, you know, we've, we've, you know, we've got this huge biodiversity, we're now down to, uh, I think we actually, did, it was about a third we did in Western Australia, which we thought was mellifluous. But even within that, to actually get enough nectar, or that produces enough nectar to then produce kgs of honey, it has to be, you know, quite a major source. So, of course, the eucalypts are just dripping. You know, you can literally shake them and you can see the nectar. You can see, shake the banksias and you can just see the nectar falling out. It's got to be that kind of nectar source to actually make good quality honey. So the other thing that I've sort of been looking at is that, you know, of course, monofloral is the drive. And unfortunately, I will be a bit biased about Western Australia. I apologise to all of you. But, you know, for us, it's Jarrah. You know, it's Jarrah, Jarrah, Jarrah or Jarrah. And I don't know if any of you have noticed, but, you know, we've got some jarin to Harrods now, and uh, we're asking a ridiculous amount of money for it, which, um, which is true. But, but it's the thing about getting that monofloral and proving it's a monofloral, and that's actually really what I'm going to talk about. But the thing that I've noticed is that there are a lot of monoflorals, but it's the timing that you take things off. You know, it's the timing on, timing off. It's the beekeeper skill in terms of the monofloral. It's, it's, it, they're there, we've got lots of them, and it's just whether we, if there's, if there's a price point for you guys to do it, and use your skills to get the monofloral's, you'll do it. I think there are a lot of very, very talented beekeepers that actually can do it and manage it. So that's, so that's what we're gonna go. So if you just think about it, I mean, the, the, just to, I don't really have to remind you, but the nectar goes, remember, to the honey stomach, all you've got is all these enzymes coming in, it goes into the honey. And the big thing that um, has been, you know, with all the, the, the 2018 scandal, adulteration scandal, was all, the big argument was all about the sugars. You know, and everybody was splitting hairs about, you know, whatever the proportions are, whatever, is that we forget that the non-sugar component of the honey is completely unique, and that's actually what we've been using. So the other thing that's come up while we've been doing our work is that in the codex work is that they always talk about the pollen, which is great if you're doing agriculture, monofloral, you know, or monoculture um, thing, you can use your pollen. For Australia, and Cal Snyderman showed that in his AgriFutures report, and he published a paper, we can't use pollen. Pollen, first of all, we've got too much biodiversity. Second thing is that our migratory habit so pollen we just can't use. So whilst it's interesting to give play, sense of place, although we're getting a lot of exotic flora coming in, um, it really is for, and certainly in terms of identifying honey, we really can't use it. So we've sort of said, okay, well, we can't use sugars because that was sort of like a heated, overheated debate. We, couldn't, we can't use pollen, so we started using the non-sugar part of the honey. So to really, so, so the, the big thing is, is the other thing also is, is that the bees are not going to the flower for the pollen. Actually, when we're making honey, we're going, we're focusing on the nectar. So we really need to know what's the connection between the nectar and the honey. And so what we first sort of were working on was really seeing common patterns to, to look at that. So we used a very simple technique. You can use all sorts of techniques if you want to, and you can convert them however you want, but we used this thing called high-performance thin-layer chromatography. And as you can see, it's almost, this is Karul uh, Islam, who worked with Connie Locher, who actually brought up this technique. And I've been working with them, and Karul and I work at Y-Trace, now we spun off, and to offer this service. You know, a lot of research stays as research, and you guys can never access it. And one of the things that we were driven to do is that if we did provide something, we needed to give it as a service, so we've actually spun it out. But what we've been doing is continuing on, carrying on with the work, because we sort of started with a concept, and we've never quite finished it off. So 
So, H so you could do this with HPLC, high performance. Um, sorry, so it's, um, and you can do, you can do with all sorts of techniques, but we just used um, uh, HPTLC because the thing about it, oh, okay, now we've got a video, sorry. I was just doing, how was he putting the sample on, but I'll, maybe I can go through it, yeah. So what it does is that if you look at this, thing, what it is is just one honey sample, but what we do is we develop it in four different light uh, well, sort of light, and we also derivatize it. So what it does is that um, it just shows up the different substances that are within the honey. So this is the organic part or the non-sugar part of the honey. So it's a very small portion of the honey. But um, if you look at the lines across, if you, it, you, that is actually one substance. I'm just showing you if you've got, so it's, it's, so it's one honey developed four different times, and then with the different colours that come up, you can actually start identifying substances because you look across and you say, OK, I've got so many substances in here, and you identify them. But the thing that's great about marketing is, first off, is that I can give it to you, and you can see straight away, once you get to know what you're looking for, you can tell whether you've got that nectar or not. And then I'll show you towards the end is how you can stylize it to do whatever you want to, for your packaging and to give us, to tell a story. Remember, the strongest thing you can do in marketing is tell a story. So what we're trying to do is develop a story for you to market the highest quality honey that you actually have. So if we go through, so this is just to show you how regular and how often, so these are all different honeys, and these are all Mary. Mary happens to be our best monofloral in Western Australia. It's just... When it flowers, nothing else really flowers. So it's just one of those, we're just very lucky. Um, so, but you can see it's got a very distinct pattern. It's repeated over and over again. So if we look at Jarrah, we also have a very similar, it's a bit more complicated, but we do have a pattern as well. So it's basically six substances actually make up the signature. We've just had our paper published on this and accepted, which is great. So it's six substances that actually come up, or phenolics that come up to give the signature. So as soon as you see those, you can actually say, OK, we've got um, Jarrah. But the point was, is what we want to do for the story was to tie it back to the nectar, because there's absolutely no argument to actually do that thing. So what we did was, this is the Mary. So you can see the nectar on the right-hand side and the honey on the left-hand side. And on the, on, as you can see, that there is some change that happens, and of course, you know, Peter Brooks has actually looked at this really excited because I think he's going to go down and actually work out why those changes happen between the nectar to the honey. But as you can see, there's so see the top brown that's on the right hand side in the white light, which is the white one. You can see that it moves and it changes into it gets stronger with the red. So we're just trying to work, they're still there as impressions, but things slightly change. Some get stronger, some get weaker. It's the same if you do it for the Jarrett. The Jarrah does the same, except the, the, on the nectar one, you can see that on the white light, the brown one actually moves further down, and actually moves, so we think that gets glycosylated. So we're just trying to work out what's happening, but the same, the similar pattern actually happens, and they're definitely, you can show that they're definitely related. So what we did is we've actually submitted this to the International Atlas of the, the HPTLC International, International Atlas. The reason we're doing everything totally open because we've all been through the Brooker experience and there was a lot of discussion about Brooker's database being um, secret. We've decided to be totally open. And if you ever want to check anything that we've ever done, you can actually go and do it. If you can, there's exactly how we've done it, what you mean to see, it's actually registered and we're going to go through all the different nectar so you can actually check our work and do it again. If you, somebody buys your honey on the east and wants to check your claims, they can do it. So it's the same as like when you do codex, if you claim you've got a moisture content of whatever, there's a set uh, methodology that's meant to be followed, and they can repeat it. If you say you've got an EC of whatever, electroconductivity, um, same thing, you can repeat it. There's set methodology. So this is a way of claiming a set methodology to do it. So also what's happened is you need to, because we don't want to that be the only technique, we need to identify the compounds so that you can use other methodologies, not just our methodology that we've done. So we've been trying to identify them. With the JARA, we've identified four of them, 
Two of them are eluding us. We can't actually identify them. But what is great about HPTLC is we can still use it even though we don't know what the substances actually are because they're a definite signature. So just the other thing that came up, of course, when you've got a very valuable honey that's like five times the price from the other honey, you want to make sure that you have that expensive honey and not the other one. So they want to know, okay, well, what happens if we do have some co-flowering? What happens if you do have something in the area? You've still got Jarrah honey. And as you can see, if we mix that in with parrot butch, which is Banksia sessilis, um, you can still see that you can see the signature. It is diluted, but it's still there. And the question is, okay, well, you know, are we going to talk about percentages and whatever? There's been a long discussion about that. I don't know if you've noticed, but in New Zealand, they've completely dropped the language of percentages because it is impossible to actually measure percentages of one to the other. It's, it would just be an absolute mathematical nightmare to try and do that. So it's been dropped. But the point is, is that if you can see it, you've got that nectar. But I do think what you should do is change the story. Because what happens is, is if you put Banksia sessilis back in with Jarrah honey, Jarrah is known for its high fructose content, so it doesn't, it's very slow to crystallise. As soon as you add Banksia sessilis into it, you've suddenly got a higher level of glucose in there, and it's going to crystallise. So you have to change a story. The story's great. It's a beautiful plant. Both of them are stunning. You can imagine how you could put it up on your website, and you could do your, you know, your batch number and link it, you know, and actually tell your story about where it's from, where the land, the beautiful forest, the pristine grounds that we have, everything that goes with it. So the other thing is to actually, we have to align with what the international community are doing. So at the moment, Codex is it. And even what I found really interesting when we were looking at the, uh, the new ISO standard that's coming out, is they still refer back to the Codex. Codex is still the benchmark. It's still the benchmark, whatever happens, and they, they're adding to it, but Codex was the benchmark. So I haven't had many, uh, and I'm hoping that everybody knows, so Codex is where our definition of honey comes from, even for our Australian standard. Our Australian standard is particularly weak, very, very weak. All it does is say moisture content, which is amazingly 21%, which I think it would ferment pretty much at 21%. I don't think I would store my honey at that high moisture content, especially if you had any a drop of yeast in there, you'd be in trouble, I would say. And the other thing was basic sugars. I think it's, it's you don't have to have sucrose in there. I think it's a low-level sugar, but it's, it's very wishy-washy if you go back and have a look at it. But so in these things, but even when you look at these codex tests, what I thought was really interesting was that there's only two of them, which are the ones in brown, the fructose glucose and the electric, the EC, are the ones that actually tie your honey to your region, to, to, which is very, very broad. Um, the EC, you know, with all our eucalypts, we have a very high EC here, just because of our soils. You know, we've got such ancient soils, it'll take it up to that. So, but, yeah, so, you know, that was it. And the rest of them actually about the quality of the honey. So if you're exporting honey, you will have hit these over and over again and beyond it. And you'll, we'll be getting on to beyond it, which is happening. It's amazing what tests you have to do to export, which are not in any of the standards at the moment. I think that's actually what surprises me, is what countries ask for that are actually not in the standards at all. So anyway, so the big thing is really the thing is, OK, so just to have a test and everything's you know, OK, but you have to have some sort of protection of that. So the next step is to get, unfortunately, into the legal, legal zone, as we call it. So one's a geographical indication. So the biggest difference between a geographical indication and a certification trademark is with a geographical indication, you have to have something of region, which in Victoria, you're kind of crowded around, you know, so it's a bit, little bit difficult. But both of them have qualities and characteristics that you've got to, you know, that you should define. So there's, there's a similarity there. So while there's a big difference, there's a, there's a thing. The other thing I need to tell you is that the certification trademarks are a lot cheaper. Um, to go down the GI, is, a geographical indication, it does take, you know, a little bit more cost to actually do that. So we're looking at both of those to see what we can do. But, but if you look, you know, I was sort of looking at, you know, where you guys sit and... When we talk, sorry, in botanical terms, we talk about the bi biogeographical regions. So this is what Australia's been divided into, is biogeographical regions. And um, 
you've got so sort of bolded the three that you're unique, you are unique here. The rest of them you sort of go into other states and whether you work as a region. I always think, you know, when in Western Australia we are totally isolated and it's a good thing that we come across here and see, you know, what's happening with you guys. But you know, you mix very much even the way you move your bees. So you're basically a region all together. And, you, and I think it's a conversation all of you need to have is, you know, what you're going to do if you want to do a GI. Um, but if you actually look, I think what flora survives and forest survives will actually define you. So you're exactly the same as what we are. Um, basically, we've lost our wheat belt totally. We don't have a stitch of flora left there. We've only got basically our forest that's left, and we've got the Murchison, which is now becoming a massive area for us, and we've got the Great Northern Forest. So we're very much defined in Western Australia by where we have preserved our forests and our flora. And I'd say you guys are going to be very similar about how you approach that in terms of where you've, where you've um, conserved. So the first thing that you have to do, it doesn't matter which way you're going to protect yourselves, if you, you have to define specifications. So remember the goal is to differentiate yourselves from all the imported honey coming in. This is the biggest first goal that you're trying to do. So things you do anyway, you know, and that was sort of, I was thinking, you know, sometimes we don't acknowledge what we do, you know, and people don't know that we do it. So first off is, um, you know, you're up to date with all your government levies. Your bee husbandry meets Australian standards. Well, your Arbic has done a fantastic job with that, and through Bee Qual has been working to define those, and we'll get on to that. The quality of the honey, now that's a debate, and I think, you know, that I think will be said, you know, talked about quite a bit about what's simple that we can do um, to do that. And then you've got, of course, your HACCP, all of you, if you're, if, you're, if you're bottling honey, you've got HACCP, and it's quite straightforward to do it, included in Bee Qual. And then you've got your labelling, which we did a little, well, actually, we, it's always a royal we because of the, when, you know, when I was in the Cooperative Research Centre, you know, I swallowed everybody else's research. Sharon's totally used to it, so you'll hear from Sharon later. But Sharon did a, a study looking at, you know, how the labelling was, so it was about three years ago, Sharon? Three years? 40% compliance in labelling in Western Australia. We were like, ooh, okay, there's a big problem there. So, I don't know, so you sort of say, okay, these things, you know, you think you'd be quite normal. I think it's better nowadays. Um, and then the two I put in the, the brown was if you, we were going to do the geographical indicator or if you were going to do something on a second level. So, so the second column that I put to the right is really an upper level, and it's things that we really need to discuss at an at a Australian level, and that's things you know, d defining monoflorals. We need to set our own standard in terms of that. We need to set our own standard in terms of bioactivity. We've got, you know, whether it's, uh, and I'm and sorry, I, you can see I'm from Western Australia, I said TA, I didn't say MGO, but, you know, it should be either one, it doesn't matter. And then organic is a separate thing, but everybody uses different ones. You know, we need to decide which organic certification we're actually going to use for our industry. Um, and then there's the, you know, chemical free, you know, whether we're going to say that or not, we've got to decide, we're going to hit it. You, if you export, you're going to be hitting it, so we need to address it. Um, and then the raw, this raw thing, it's coming up as an ISO standard. We need to say, do we want this, what is our raw? You know, raw is a very strong, it's as strong as organic, it's a strong marketing tool. We need to not abuse it and actually use it to the optimum. So there's a few things that we've actually, and you know, this is you guys, this is you all to sit together, all that, you know, with the beekeepers and the packers. There's, it's not the packers to decide, it's the beekeepers as well, because it dictates your price and your, the cost of your enterprise. You know what I'm sort of saying in terms of what you do in the field impacts about what you produce and that, so it's very much about you guys. The step two is the process, because it has to be audited. So we've, you know, I mean, I've, I, you know, that's why Arbic set up BQOL. We've spent a lot of time with BQOL to get it digitised, get it up and, up and ready for you. It's a backbone. There's a lot to be done. But BQOL sits there as an audited process. So it has to be by an independent auditor, which BQOL have established, and they've been doing all the hard work behind. It would, at the moment, it would only be for the B qual, not B trace. B trace would is just is really an introduction into B qual. So it would have to be at the B qual level to meet 
the information that you require to meet the criteria. We'd have to but review that. But so there, it's there. We've actually got the system already. You just have to have what the criteria are. You'd have to pick them up and check that they're in the audit. And then you get your certification. And then it's there. But then there's the compliance. So what happens if somebody claims they're an Australian honey and they use your thing? Somebody's got to chase them and give them that legal letter to say, you know, cease doing your practices. You're not meeting our standards. And we have to protect our backyard. So there has to be some compliance, somebody watching. And you guys are great. I mean, you know, I sort of hear, you know, when people see a product that's wrong, that you're picking it out and you speak. I and mean, that's why, you know, there's this backlash on some of the honey that's coming in. It's great. Keep your eyes open. It's all good. So there's Be Qual, which Sharon's going to cover. So I'm not going to do that at all. So, um, but what I was thinking is that, you know, there's so LB Tech's here, which is great. Good to see you. And we do a system which I'll tell you about now. There's um, on a purple hive split off into another system. So there's a lot of electronic monitoring coming in of your hives. The thing that in, we never wanted was to have multiple systems. We want everything to go into one system. So with BQOS being set up with APIs, sorry, APIs is, means it can take data in from other systems. So, and even then is now, sorry, and somebody brought up, of course, Victoria's got BMAX as well, which we've been hearing about. So you, you should never, ever enter a piece of data more than once. So we have to create a system that you only ever put your data in as a beekeeper once. Whatever the, um, whatever the packer needs goes straight from your system to them, and then whatever happens for the customer goes to them, but it needs to be all protected. So we've actually just... Uh, I've got an application to help you guys and while you're working on your beehives is just to speak your information and that actually goes into data that gets stored into your systems. That will then get APIs that goes into BeeQuals as an interface. This is open to all companies that are actually doing this. This is not specific to anybody. It's been designed that we have one system that actually keeps all the data. But then what I do know is that beekeepers are terrible at sharing data. They hate it. So we've put blockchain in. So basically, the data you pass on to somebody else will be protected. It's not, they can't, you know, it's actually protected. There's no way that it can actually be uh, abused or whatever. So blockchain goes through to the packer, so, and then they can use that for their marketing. So if they use your honey and somebody else's honey and mix it into something, they're into a new lot that gets registered, it, it have both those data that they can prove the traceability. So it's about the traceability system of everything. So that's what the work is at the moment, is actually going to get that all together. So uh, just to show you what we're doing, we're doing APIS Prime. Um, so this is same smart hive monitoring. The big thing that we're trying to use is maximise the use of AI, which, you know, it's... You know, we, we all need... It's, it is amazing. It's ama I promise you, within the next couple of years, it's going to revolutionise the whole monitoring. Things that we couldn't measure before, we're going to be measuring. Um, the amount of... Uh, the, the big thing about it is that, you know, I was sort of helping... You know, help Tiffany Bates is our beekeeper, was our beekeeper for the CRC for honeybee products. And just working with her to understand the complexity of setting up experiments, you know, to get hives even before you start and whatever, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and I'm sure even with you, you never find two hives exactly the same, you know, of, e of equal strength next to each other. So it's this thing about knowing what you have when you go into experiment, and you can do huge replica replications now. So we can actually question all sorts of things now that we were never able to do. So, so the other thing about it was this long-range community was communication. Um, it's all of these things. Everybody's doing it. We're not the only ones doing it, but you know, it's to see you know how far we can go and how far we can get this technology delivered to you. Biggest challenge to all of us is cost. You know, we hear you loud and clear. You know, it's the cost of your time versus something coming in. You know, and it's how much you value your time. You know, and that's actually what happens. So, all of us have been driven about how cheaply can we get this to you that you can use it and put it in every single hive because that's actually when it really counts. So this is just oh, so this is um, just an example of certification. So this is just a concept. It's it's not on the show. It's not for sale or anything. But it was just to show you. So we did. This is Jarrah honey. We put it in a jar. We do it with the fingerprint. So we show the fingerprint. So you can do whatever design you want to do. I'm not. You know, it's up to you guys. Whatever you want to do. 
Um, when you, at the back there's got all the compliance that you have to do for you, just to show you that I did look at the fizzants and did follow all the rules. And then if you scan that at the top, we then give you the story, whatever my story is. You can change your story to whatever yours is it could be. And the, what's missing on there is because we're not the beekeeper and we're not, we, just, we were just doing it as a, at the science level, is about you in the field and doing your work and how you did it and the care that you put in to get to that jar of honey. You know, that's missing in that story. But there's a beautiful ones that you can do. Um, so it's open to you, you know, whatever you do. But what it does is it gives you that, just that proof, you know, what I'm saying is true. This is me, you know, this is who I am and I'm dinky die honest. That's what it's trying to do for you. So then there's a certification of authenticity. And then that has to come back to published papers, which is weird, you know, that's our work in the science field, is to give you the proof for what you're doing. And what's so fabulous is that now we have proof for different monoflorals. When we say this has a codex of this, or it has a TA of that, or it definitely is a, um, oh, the other GI, um, um, you know, with the sugars, you know, when uh, gly glycemic index, you know, you don't have to do a test every single time. Once you prove what the nectar is, you should be able to do some things. Might not work out for TA, because TA is a bit more complex than just the phenolic signature. But certainly some things that you could say, okay, once I've done this, I can say, because I've got JARA, I have these attributes. Or because I have yellow box, it'll have these attributes, and this is what happens. The flavor, what we found really interesting was if you mix a jar of honey and it's got a bit of red bell in it, which is a calathamnus. The red bell is so strong that it dominates the jar. It's just really funny. So even if you've got a very small amount of it, it so, so when you hear from, I don't know if Jess is actually speaking today, but Jess Lacani, when you hear her talk, it, you know, the flavors, because of the different phenolics, they have, I mean, if you've ever gone into flavors and tastes, different, different phenolics have different um, intensities of flavour, changing the flavour profile. So there still might be a flavour profile part to actually do, even though you've got the signature. So there's, but it's your story. It's building your story up. So this was my overview. I haven't gone over time. I haven't been stabbed or anything, which is good. <laughs> but anyway, so I wanted to just tell you what we were up to in trying to put the system. This is not just... This is a group of people. You know, we spend... We honestly... Uh, Sharon and I have spoken with Don. Don Muir has sort of been a great supporter of ours forever. Now we were on together with the whole of the Bee Qual community, which is great. And it would just be interesting to see, you know, to get this to you, I think will make all the difference to this, to this all this imported honey coming in. And just we need to show the difference between the quality that we produce versus what's coming in. There's just no argument, and we should be at, you know, multiples more expensive than anything else coming in and we've got to fight that and we can only fight that with doing some system like this to show you know we are the best yeah that's where it is <laughs>